Company is very progressive and very um, thorough in their mapping tools. So when I, this, this website, it has a website, you can write it down, it's really long, but when I wanna go here, I just go to Google and I type in the search bar, Weblogis, W-E-B-L-O-G-I-S. And I have a video, let me see if I can play the video while I, nope, it's not gonna let me. Um, Mm, let's see, do I have a pointer? Nope, I don't have a pointer either. Uh, so we're gonna muddle through this a little bit. Um, but when you when you go to the WebLogi system, this picture is kind of what the original landing page looks like. And you can see over there on the left, there's some check boxes. If you check the environmental check box, you'll see some things like um, uh, soils, topography, FUD plain, hydric soils, that can help you a lot when you're looking for um, what kind of soil you have. Um, and then up at the top, right above the contents, oh, another great thing on that, um, that page is imagery. You can click on the imagery and it'll give you a satellite view almost of the imagery, but Loudon is a little bit better than the satellites. Every year they do aerial images so you can get aerial imagery. Right now they have the 2020 photographs up there so you can get really current pictures of your yard. Um, and then at the top, there's also a tools tab. And I showed this in the video, so I'm a little bummed that I can't play it. Um, but if you, can, if you go there and play around with it, in the tools tab, there's a measure feature. And it lets you click on your yard. So I have like a little, like a butterfly garden in my yard and I want to see how big it is, I can click on the perimeter of that butterfly garden and it'll tell me how many square feet are in there. Or you can make one line to just click um, and tell you exactly how many feet long something is. So it's really handy if you're ordering mulch or topsoil or if you just need to get, you know, you want to know like this, this garden is 20 feet by five feet, then you can help with spacing of your plants when you're looking at plants. So that's the WebLogist tool and definitely one of my favorites. I use it a lot. I do this screen capture there a lot of times when I'm looking at my yard or if I have a client and, and we're working through something so that we've got now a picture and we can draw on that picture or whatever helps. So, so that's how you get to the WebLogist. Let's see, it won't play this video, will it? Nope. All right, that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> here's a, just a cut another picture. This is kind of what the imagery looks like. It's, it is very helpful and you can zoom in on that, the little slider bar kind of towards the middle left of your screen lets you zoom in and out. It's really handy. So go in there and play around. You can also go up to the search thing. You can search for your property. You can look at your tax data. You can look at your neighbor's tax data. <laughs> you can become the grad, Gladys Gravitz of your neighborhood. The next tool that I want to talk about is called Garden Puzzle. And this is, um, they have a demo. So if you're only gonna do it once, you, I think it's like a 30 day demo. You can log in and get the free demo for 30 days or you can play, pay for it. I wanna say it's like $30 and it's just a one-time fee. Um, but what I really like about the garden puzzle is this is what the, the screen looks like and where they have that picture of the house there, you can upload a picture of your house. And then you just pick the plants on the left and you drag and drop them over there. And they've got tons and tons of plants. Um, you know, I always look for native plants. They don't have all the native plants. So sometimes I improvise with something that I know is gonna look similar to the native plant I'm interested in. Uh, but I'll show you an example of what I used Garden Puzzle for. So this was a, a guy, um, I did this maybe a year ago for a person in Willisford and they said, well, I want more screening in this area. And they've got two trees there and I think it's a maple and uh, he just didn't like that he could see the power lines and the, the house is off in the distance there. So what I did was I drag and dropped some plants that were his existing plants there. So I found the maple and I found the, the two um, Leland cypress and I showed him what he's going to look like five, ten years from now. So that was really cool that he could see, well, I will have screening if I just leave those there. But to me, those two trees, those two Leland cypresses are really close together. In five years, uh, they're gonna be growing into each other. In 10 years, they're gonna be really overgrown. So then I kind of plugged in some more things with the, the software and I told him he needs to move those trees. So we separated them. We added some 
uh, service berry or the white blooming trees in there. And we added, or, and he moved that uh, maple tree a little bit over just to have better spacing. And then he was able to make more of a garden area and add some perennials in there. So that gave him a really good idea what that looked like. But uh, we could also then take it to the next level. There's a little button in that software. You just click it to say spring, summer, fall, whatever you wanna look at. So you can see it in the different seasons. So I really like that software quite a bit. Uh, the next software that I like is called Garden Planner. And this again has a free demo. So if you're just gonna do it once or you wanna make your picture and print it out and then you're done with the free demo, or I think it's $40. And that one might be an annual subscription. So it might not be worth it if you're not gonna be using it a whole lot. But, um, but this is a good way to get a visual representation. And you know, it's, it's nice, it's a little more, you know, it's more like their hand drawings that you would see a, a landscape designer use. Um, but but it's, it's functional and it gets the job done. So really, what I really like is just going old school. You can get some uh, graph paper and some tracing paper and go to town. And we're gonna, we're gonna walk through these things to consider in design using this method because this is just available to everybody. It's easy, it, the learning curve is not very steep. So let's talk through this a little bit. And we're gonna talk about the things to consider when you're thinking about the design. And I'm talking about design in a very loose sense of the word. I'm not a designer. I have very minimal training in landscape design, but, um, and I have a lot of friends who are landscape designers, so I don't wanna put them down too much, but I feel like I can do it myself all the time, even though that may not be uh, the best design but I like to get my hands dirty. I like to do it myself and I don't like to pay other people to do some of those things. So in the winter when it's cold, this is a great thing to sit down with your sketch pad and your tracing paper and think about your site, your soils, your water and your light. And we're gonna walk through each of those things and kind of what our map it would look like. So the first thing you would wanna do is on the graph paper, create a base map. So. That's gonna have your footprint of all your buildings, any paved services, surfaces. You may wanna put utility lines. And the most important thing to me is the north arrow. Um, we get a lot of people in the nursery who will come in and they'll say, well, you know, I've got this area. It, you know, it, it gets some sun, but maybe not all the sun, all the way sun. And they can't always articulate what their site is like. <clears throat> but if you had just this base map, with your structures and the north arrow, <clears throat> we can get a pretty good idea of where the light is. You can add in trees, anything that's existing already, you can add into there. Um, and measurements would be a great addition to this person's drawing. Uh, but measurements are, are really helpful. A lot of times people come in and they'll say, well, it's from about me to that tree over there. You know, they don't always have a good, accurate measurement of how much space they have which can be really helpful when you're thinking about what plants to put there. So come up with your base map. You can get as fancy as you want. You can put your trees in and get out your colored pencils and uh, go, go to the office store or order from Amazon these days, I guess. But um, think about what's already there and then make a note, you know, put the name, how big it is now, what's maybe what year you planted it in, in and how's it doing? You know, that's very telling. If, if you've got, you know, your oak there and it's doing great, fine, but your elm over here isn't doing so well, you know, watch it. Put the year on this drawing as well, because that's going to be helpful too, to know um, what year I planted, what year I drew this, how things were looking. Was this last year? Or was it two years ago? So any information you can put on there is really helpful. All right. So when we're talking about soils, um, it's a good place to go to the Loudon mapping system. It'll tell you um, on the soils tab, it will tell you how, um, what type of soil is, is it loam or silty clay loam? Um, so you can get a good idea of that. But that said, for those of us who live in uh, a neighborhood that's all new houses, generally you may not have that kind of soil because your top soil may have been eroded away when they took the tractors through or even just scooped up by the tractors and carried off somewhere. So even if you don't know what type of soil you have, you can 
you'll know where it's compacted. You can see these people, they've got it compacted where uh, they walk from the house to the shed. And it's funny, I'm pointing to the screen here as I'm talking to you, so <laughs> you can't see that. Uh, so, or, you know, maybe up in the front corner there, that's where the kids stand to get the school bus. And so it's compacted there. Or you can see where things are eroding maybe away from the house. So they need to think about that. Or there's where, this is where the water stands. So they need wet, think about wet soils there. So you, you can know a lot about your yard by just walking around it, even in the winter, you know, things still stay soupy in the winter. You can see where things have eroded. You can even, even during the winter, you can walk through and say, you know, I like this spot in the summer, but in the winter, I wish I had something there with it that would add a little interest. So you can make notes like that as well. <clears throat> so, and this soils map could be on the transparent paper. And that way you can just take it off and on when you're, if you wanted to work on soils, you can put it on, you could uh, take it off if you, when you wanna work on your water drawing. And for the water drawing, there's also on the web logis for the Loudoun County, um, it shows floodplains. You can see the terrain. So you can see how steep your grading is. So you can see where the water should be flowing. And from living where you are, you know where the water does flow. So make a note of that as well. You can use that, that mapping software to uh, measure the square footage of your roof or your driveway so you know how much runoff you're getting, where that water's running to and why things are as wet. You can get a ton of information there. <clears throat> and then we go to light and energy. So you can, um, you, you know where the sun is because they've drawn it here. We know where north is. But, you know, if we look at the front there by that window where it says full sun, that's probably like double sun because we can see they noted where their window is. So that's getting a lot of reflection off the house there as well. So we want something really dry for that area. Um, but put where, where your AC unit is because if you can shade that a little bit, that's going to save on your HVAC bills. This person also noted where the wind comes from. Some places we've got really uh, strong winds that flow through and there's a lot of plants that don't like wind. So it's worth noting where your wind is. But you can also, um, this is where we, if we come back to this slide up here with the trees. You know, that will help as well if we can overlay those. We've got them on our transparent paper and we overlay them. And then you can see, help to see where shade is. And you know, they, uh, let's go back here by the back left corner of the house, they have a sunny area, but there's also a tree there. So that would, might lead me to question something. And then when you have all these layers done, it should look something like this. And it's, it's great because you can see on the right there, this person didn't like one and they could just crumple it up and toss it out, but you can overlay it, you know, and then you put the year on your um, transparent paper and you can do a new one every year when you're sitting there in the winter. Lorraine, are there any questions so far on this process? Hi, Julie. I'm not sure if you want to save this one to the end or not. Okay. But, um, hold on, let me grab it up here. Um, she'd love tips on site selection. She has a few acres in Hamilton and most of her property is on a hill. No previous experience, but wanting to get started. Wanna okay. So you're, you've got a lot of area there that you can play with, right? And so, um, you know, it's, it's very daunting when you have a large property, even if you have a small property and you're new to gardening and you have all this area where I could plant here, I could plant there. Uh, so, you know, what do you do? I would, I would start first by thinking about what do I want to get from it? You know, do you want to have a, a, a area where you can walk through and see butterflies? Do you want to provide some nesting habitat for birds? Do you want to um, you want to see the squirrels come by? You know, what do you want to get from the site? Because we're we're gardening for ourselves, but we also are gardening for wildlife. So we have to keep those things in mind, so that our our landscapes can be productive for both us and the environment. So think about what you want from the space. Um, I'm sure you have some ideas for your whole property of, of things that you want to happen there, what you want it to look like, and then just tackle small bits at a time, because if you do too much, it gets so overwhelming. So I would, you know, 
think about, you know, do you want a butterfly garden? Do you want a bird habitat? Do you want to put in a pond? I mean, you could really go all out. And you can always, there's a lot of landscape designers who would come to your house and just do a walk around for a small fee and not charge you for a full on design. A lot of places, um, like I, I can give you a list if you want to email, email me separately um, of some of the designers that I work with that I know do that. They'll come and they'll just walk around. You take notes, you pick their brain, and then they're gone and you don't have to buy a design or an installation or anything from them. So that can be helpful as well. Um, I can also, at this point, put in a plug. I don't do that, but Loud and Wildlife has an auction coming up at the end of February where we're auctioning off birdhouses that are art and some experiences. And one of the things that you can uh, bid on in the auction is I'll come to your house for uh, an hour or so and we'll walk around and you can pick my brain and, and get ideas for your garden. So hopefully that answers that question a little bit. Any other questions? I just wanna mention that some of those birdhouses are on display in the Ashburn Library yes. lobby display case. So make sure you take a look at those when you go in there. Um, someone is asking for tips on identifying prevailing winds. So you can just put, um, there actually, there's a, a thing called the sparrow spooker that a lot of people will put out in front of their birdhouse. And it looks kind of like 10 or 20 of the little fronds off of a, a cheerleader's pom-pom and it spooks the sparrows away. But you can hang one of those out on a pole and see where the wind blows. You know, that'll show you the direction without hanging a whole, you know, airport windsock in your yard. And that can be really helpful to see where the wind's blowing. You know, you just notice it when you walk by the window or if you have a windy day, check it out. Um, but, you know, without a weather station or a windsock, it can be hard, but you can go out and just notice it when you're, when you're out there, or put, hang your little thing up there for a few weeks and see where the wind blows. Any Thanks, Julie. That's it for questions right now. Well, we will continue on. So we're going to talk about now we've got this plan. I kind of know what I want or where I want to plant. Um, and I know how much space I have. I know what conditions I have. So now I'm going to think about, um, I'm going to start choosing the plant material. So we have all those things that we have to um, think about and the space. So when we're choosing plant material, I want, there's a couple definitions I want to go over first, because there are a lot of questions that people don't always, um, get right away and to me they're second nature because i deal with them every single day so an annual is the first thing and that's a plant that just dies every year you it's like your pansies um petunias the the mums that we buy in the fall they're things that you buy and are they can't survive here because our winters are too hard so they're gone next year so you buy them every single year to me annuals are worthless i don't think if it's annual we shouldn't be planting it uh, I like the perennials. Perennial means it comes back year after year after year. And then when we're thinking about perennials, um, you all, it's also worthwhile to know that plants have a lifespan, just like we do. They're a living thing. Um, they, some of them live three to five years. Some of them, you know, somebody has grandma's peonies for 50 years and they're still going strong. So it's, all the plants are different. And, and that said, when you're reading tags for a plant and it says this plant should be, you know, two to four feet and it likes moist to average soils, that's all um, relative. Plants, they're living things and sometimes they do really well in a spot and sometimes they don't in the same spot in someone else's yard. So just know that those are guidelines when you're reading a tag, they're not hard and fast rules. I have had several people come back and they're saying, you know, I bought this from you and the tag said that it was going to get four foot tall, but it's 10 feet tall. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's something else in the soil. So just know that they're guidelines and plants are living things and you just never know what it's going to want to do when you get it in your yard. Uh, the next definition is a native plant and that's a plant that is evolved in the, the location. So it's, it's been here for as long as we can map. And as, as long as uh, we have records for. And then an invasive plant is a plant that is it's not native and it's aggressive. So we could have um, plants that are non-native, but they're not necessarily invasive, like a Japanese maple. You plant it, they don't necessarily spread around a whole lot. They don't cause damage or harm. But then we have plants that are invasive, 
like um, Bradford pear. We see all along the roads now the white flowers in the spring, and that was planted as part of, um, I think they started planting it in Ashburn with, with every house, and it, it evolved and it crossed with our native pear, and now we have this Bradford pear that grows everywhere, and it's causing a lot of, of damage. It doesn't support any wildlife, so it's really problematic. And, you know, kind of think about why do we care if it's native or non-native, um, but our landscapes, you know, we ask them to do a lot. We ask them to look beautiful. We ask them to not take a lot of water, to provide shade, to do all this stuff. But the big thing that they do is they provide food. And we need our, our landscapes to provide food for uh, wildlife so that our ecosystem can continue to function because we're, we're destroying it at massive rates. So this slide looks a little bit of a mess in the translation between my computer and my iPad here. So I'm sorry for that. But what it's really showing is um, the woody plants and oak is the one that supports the most species. So if you have a spot in your yard, when you're planting things out, plant in an oak or plant in some of those um, tall shrubs that have great berries for, for our birds. So think about who you're supporting and the value to the ecology of your plants, because that's how we're gonna get out of all the trouble we're in with our environment. So a lot of people ask, how do we know if something's native or not native? Um, the USDA, I just Google USDA and then my plant name, and it will show um, a list, or it will show a map of, of the plant and where it's native. You can even zoom in to different levels um, and see at the county level how native something is or is not. And then the, the next two I'm going to go over in the opposite order that they're there on your screen. So first, first we're going to look at the flora of Virginia. And their website looks like this. And you can just type in VA Plant Atlas and you'll find this website. Now you can click on these pictures here and, it, and say, okay, well, I know it's a, a gymnosperm. And you click on that and then it's going to ask you, you know, does it, how many needles does it have or, and how many bundles are, are the bundles three needles or five needles? And does it have cones? And what do the cones look like? But to me, what's a lot easier is up on the upper right, there's a search bar. And you can change that from botanical name to common name. So you could search either way. And you can you just plug it in. And then it comes up with this screen. And it tells you where it's native. The counties with little red dots are native there. If there's no dot, like some of those in the lower left, it's not native there. If there happens to be a blue dot, that means that this is found in our county in natural areas. However, it was introduced, it's not native. And then there's sometimes you'll see a gray, bot, uh, gray dot where they don't know if something's native or not. And this plant happens to be one of my favorite viburnums, a plant, a shrub for partial shade, viburnum dentatum. Fantastic fall color. You could use it in the front of your house and it will be a stunner, but the birds love the berries. It'll be just covered with berries. And then all of a sudden, they'll all be gone because the birds discovered it. Uh, the next site that I want to look at when you're choosing plants, um, and this one I had a video for, so I don't have quite as nice a, we'll have to talk through it a little bit, but um, it's the Plant Nova Natives. And Plant Nova Natives is a nonprofit in Northern Virginia. And what they do is they, um, they publish this book that you see in the center of your screen with the bright red flowers. And you, it's, the book is here online for free, or you can buy copies of the book at various places. But if you scroll down just a little bit on the screen, there's a tool that's the plant finder. So if you click on the plant finder on the left, you have to click on the little, um, what do they call it? Magnifying glass to search. And you can type, you can choose height. So you know you're planting in the front of your house and you want something that's only three feet tall. You can type in, I want something, you know, around three feet tall, and it'll come back with plants that are that height. And you can put many things in there, like you can put um, the soil. So you can say, I want, it's wet, it's dry, whatever. You can put in the light. So when you go back to your maps that you've all planned out, you've got all your conditions, you plug them into something like this, and it'll tell you lots of options for those, uh, those spots. Um, any questions on those two websites well, before we continue on? 
Uh, not specifically on the website, but someone wrote that I like flowers in our very small garden. So I planted tulips and daffodils for spring, different lilies for summer, hardy mums for autumn, but this leaves nothing on the ground in winter. Are there any plans to add some beauty to winter in our area? So, um, so I, 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 that's a great question. It's kind of hard to answer with my native plant hat on because, um, there's not a whole lot of evergreen things for winter and but it sounds like the things that you have in your garden you're not a native plant snob like some of us can be so <laughs> some people get really fussy about that uh you know and and um like there's mums you could add some of the native mums they they like in the aster family they bloom a lot longer so that would bring you longer into the season but you could add some small shrubs too like winterberry that um, it's not evergreen, but it has bright red berries for it. They, they persist through the entire um, entire winter until the birds discover them and will gobble them up. But they are, it's a great one because it's a really nice pop of color. Um, with my, if I take my native plant hat off, one of my favorite plants for winter is hellebores. Um, they are not native, but they are evergreen all through winter, and they'll start blooming really, really early, like January. So they're they're really cool, and the deer don't like them, which is really nice. So you know, hellebores are there. They're not native, but I mean, I grow them. Just don't tell my wildlife friends. I love them. Can you spell that, and I will put it in the um, chat box for everyone. Sure. It's um well H E L L E. B O R U S or something okay. like that. I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but if you type that in to Google, you should get something back. And there's <laughs> colors. So sounds great. That's it for questions right now. All right. So I just wanted to talk about a few things to stay away from when you go to garden centers. Um, you know, I'd love to go to other nurseries and see what they're selling and what they have. And when I started my business five or six, gosh, I guess it's been six and a half years ago now. Um, I did it because there was no place in Loudoun County to buy native plants that um, we knew were not treated with pesticides. But I love going to garden centers. So I still go. Um, and I still buy stuff too at garden centers because I'm a plantaholic. It's it's a problem and I do it without planning and I put plants in the wrong place and I'm constantly digging them up and editing them and changing where I put plants. Um, but if you go into a garden center, these are all things that I found in 2020 in garden centers. Um, and, and they're all things that we should not be planting. Uh, burning bush is invasive. It gets out. If you've ever had a neighbor who has bamboo, you know how fast it grows and these tree these this list is all like that and there's two trees that I would caution people from planting at all or two plants the first one is butterfly bush because butterflies love it it's very pretty but it is invasive it spreads into the forest and the second problem with butterfly bush is that it's very high in sugar at a time when our butterflies need uh, nectar that's higher in fat so they load up on this sugar and it's not clear whether or not they can make their migrations complete. So it's just, it's like feeding your kids McDonald's all the time. So I would stay away from butterfly bush. And the second one is Nandina, which is everywhere. It's in so many neighborhoods, it's so many houses because Nandina has, it's evergreen. It grows in a myriad of places. And Nandina has these beautiful red berries that the birds will eat. If there's nothing else there, they will eat Nandina and Nandina berries are loaded with cyanide. So it's not good for the birds. They don't have to eat, I think only like one or two berries and, and it's the end for the bird. So those are the two that I strongly caution people not to plant in their, in their landscaping. All right, so we're gonna go on to now some pretty pictures. Kind of the more fun part. So this is a, a landscape um, that I just wanted to highlight a few things in. One, this is a mix of native and non-native plants. You can see over on the left, there's kind of a tall pink puffy flower. That's Joe Pieweed. And Joe Pieweed can get eight to 10 feet tall. It can be a monster, but they put it kind of in the back of the garden and they framed it with some nice grasses. 
And it it's a, was a nice way to make this really big, unruly plant look like it has a home and it belongs there. And they also, this is kind of a large area. And so they put black-eyed Susans in there. And if you look up black-eyed Susans, there are some varieties that just spread like crazy. So this was a great way to fill in the spaces, but also, um, like you can see down in the right corner here, they've got some bare spots. If they don't like those bare spots, that's a great plant to dig it up and move it over there without having to purchase plants constantly. So you can see, you know, there's a lot, always opportunities to continuously edit as you're, you're going through, you know, year to year. And I know that this garden was planted heavily and there were no bare spots the first year or two, but year three or four, you know, plants die and, and uh, they, they need to move some things around. This next slide, it's at, it's in a park actually, <laughs> but it's um, just a, an interesting use to me that there is absolutely zero mulch here. It's right along the sidewalk where you would expect to see, um, see the landscaping look like the plate of a four-year-old where their food can't touch and their plants can't touch. But here it's just really neat to see it's all kind of jumbled together. It's a mix of colors. So when you're planning your, your garden, think about what kind of look you like. If, you, if you're okay with this, you can go with all sorts of plants, but if you like that manicured look where the plants don't touch each other, um, look, look. there's some plants, plants called cultivars, which is a cultivated variety. You know, it's a plant that's been chosen for a specific character, characteristic. So look for some of those cultivars that stay nice and tidy. Because a lot of times with native plants, especially people say they just go crazy. They don't, they look unruly. So if you don't like this look, look for some cultivars that are grown specifically to stay tidy. And then one other house here is another one of those where to me, like I, I like the look, but when I really start to look at it, it, it kind of stresses me out because it's encroaching on the walkway. <laughs> so just know that you have to maintain your yard. And this does, I think, still look beautiful, but if they would have maintained that walkway, it would look so much better. Um, you know, and when you're, one tip that I forgot to add late earlier, when you're laying out where you want to put your garden beds, and we can do this in Virginia because there's no snow on the ground all the time, is just take your garden hose. Take your garden hose out there and lay it out on the ground and use it to, you know, bump it in. I like this curvier, make it, no, I want it out. I don't want it quite as curvy. So your garden hose can be a great tool to line out where you put a garden bed. Another thing that I like to do um, is when I've got a, an area that I want planted, I save all my cardboard and I put the cardboard down and put the mulch on top of it and see how do I like it there. You can then drag your cardboard a little bit if it's a big enough piece and, and edit the edges a little bit, but that cardboard will eventually break down. It will kill the grass and then you can plant into that. And it's a great planting thing, maybe for fall, but I'm very impatient. I'll do it like the week before I want to plant something or sometimes even the day of, and then I'm out there trying to hack into the cardboard and put my plant in the little hole. But cardboard and mulch can be really helpful when you're making your designs. Okay, any other questions, any questions about the planning process? Because then I'm going to talk about a couple of my favorite plants before we wrap up. Uh, someone is asking if you have a recommendation for a space where grass is now, um, but she wants to replace it with ground cover so she can walk on all that she can walk on all year, like an echo grass. Okay, so my next slide is ground covers. <laughs> um, oh, perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think when you see mulch, it's a lost opportunity to plant a plant. There's not a whole lot of ground covers that will take a lot of foot traffic like grass will. There are some, um, I think Ernst Seeds, E-R-N-S-T Seeds, they're out of Pennsylvania. They have a new eco grass and I haven't heard of anybody who's tried to grow it or not, but it's apparently native grasses that you should be no mow or, or minimum mow. So that might be um, one, one thing. Uh, the bottom right here, the pink flower is Aster Woods Pink. Oh, wait, next slide we'll talk about. Let's go there first. The flocks. There's some flocks like this 
uh, up on the top right is subdulata moss phlox. And that's a white variety, but it comes in anything from purple and pink to blue. There's even like a crazy one with stripes on the petals, which I'm sure does not help any pollinators anywhere. But, um, you know, if that's what floats your boat, um, try and plant a variety so that there's things that are good for the pollinators there. But that moss phlox can take a good deal of foot traffic. And a really cool thing about that is it's evergreen. That's probably my favorite phlox. And I, I, Phlox gets its own slide here because I love Phlox. There's one for any situation. Uh, this, this one is really low. It grows in full sun. It does not take a lot of water. It's drought tolerant. It's salt tolerant. Um, I like to plant, you know, the, the true native species of that one is a pale pink. It's, it's beautiful just by itself. You don't need all those crazy colors. The pale pink is really pretty. And the bees love it as well. I see them all over this. It blooms early in the spring and it's evergreen all year round, all 12 months. So that's probably my favorite one for um, being steppable. And then this sedum ternatum on this one, which is the lower left, the first one on the bottom, three leaf stone crop, that can take a, a little bit of foot traffic. I wouldn't say walk on it every day, but you know, maybe once a week or so. And it's also, it's, I would say semi evergreen. It does keep quite a few green leaves through the winter. It spreads really nicely. It doesn't spread all over the place, but it's clump gets bigger and bigger and it does drop seeds, but the seeds don't fly. They just drop. So you will get sprouts around the plant, but the flowers are the cutest little flowers. They're white with like little black speckles on it. So they it looks kind of like salt and pepper. So that's a, that's a really nice one also. Um, and then a couple other of my favorite ground covers I put in the top right here. We'll start there, green and gold. Um, I, grow, I have that growing in my yard, but that's probably one of the most popular plants in the nursery. Everybody loves it because it blooms profusely like you see it now in that picture with um, just covered in yellow flowers. And then once it's done blooming over the winter, over the summer, you'll get one or two flowers here and there. So it's kind of like a nice little surprise, but it just, it covers well, it stays dense, it chokes out weeds, it's really good. And it's good for sun to mostly sun. The next one there is called Golden Ground Cell or Pacara Aurea. And this, this is really, I included this one because it is so fantastic. If you're fighting with things like Japanese stilt grass and you have a large area where it can grow, I would not plant this if you've only got an acre and an acre is a lot of land, right? It, it spreads like crazy, but it's evergreen. It has really nice, clean looking leaves, um, beautiful yellow flowers in the spring. Some people don't like it because they turn to, they look kind of like a dandelion then when they go to seed, but it's pretty and it competes with Japanese stilt grass. I have a nice patch down in the nursery. If you stop by, you can, I'll show it to you. And it's really doing a good job of keeping the stilt grass um, out of the way. The next one is uh, American ginger. And you can see there how it, it likes to grow under a tree. It spreads really nicely. The only problem with ginger is a couple things. It's very slow to establish. I would say to get a patch like that, it's gonna take five to eight years. Um, but it's beautiful once it does. If you can buy quite a few plants, space them out about eight inches apart, it'd be really good. But it's kind of an expensive plant because it's a slow grower. And then the other problem is it's got really cool little maroon flowers, but they're very small and they're underneath the leaf. But it's very, it's a very cool plant. And it is, it was used by Native Americans in teas and stuff like that. Um, the next one it's got the wrong caption on there. It's not Pelosa Downey. It is uh, Tiarella cordifolia. And I think that's a fantastic plant for any yard. It's kind of a shady plant. It gets these beautiful, highly fragrant wands of white flowers in the late spring. And it's just gorgeous. And, and naturally these variegated leaves happen. You'll find some that don't have the variegated leaves quite as much, uh, but it's, it's really nice. And then I also um, included one for fall here, the Aster Woods Pink, because as a ground cover, it stays very, really low, like six to 10 inches. 
nice clumping. I mean, it stays pretty tight and compact. You can't almost can't even see the leaves there because it's so heavy with flowers. And those late season flowers are so important for our migrating butterflies and our late our bees that tend to stick around for a lot longer. So we'll go back here. This is our phlox. I didn't really talk too much about um, the top left is garden phlox, which is the one that everybody's grandma grew and the middle on the bottom and the two bottom right ones there. Those are both for sun. They are good performers. Uh, phlox in general can, can get some powdery mildew, but if you plant it where it gets plenty of light and plenty of airflow, it's not a big problem. It's just cosmetic on phlox anyway. And then the Stolonifera, which is the top center and the bottom left, the Divericata are two for shade. Divericata is a little bit higher and the Stolonifera is um, a really low creeping, but it does great, looks fantastic with ferns. If you like ferns, this comes out and blooms like crazy. And then the ferns come out when this is all finished. So, okay, what other questions do we have? And we have a lot of questions. <laughs> Just want you all to know we have about a hundred people on right now, so there's a lot of questions. When's the best time to plant phlox, and are they deer resistant? Let's start with those. So most phlox is like candy for deer; they love it. The subdulata they seem to leave it alone because the leaves are a little bit pokier. So they, I have, I've got some growing right along the side of our driveway. We have a lot of deer pressure, and they don't touch it. Um, my other flocks, I've got some of the ones that the deer love, the garden flocks, but I planted it with mountain mint, which the deer do not like. And it's a native that's um, very fragrant, really good for pollinators. It's fairly aggressive, but not as aggressive as the culinary mint that most people know of. So mountain mint is a good companion plant for the paniculata because then the deer smell that and they tend to leave the paniculata alone. So the garden flocks and mountain mint are a really nice combination. Next question. Okay, how does golden groundsel do in wet woods? It does really good. It likes moisture. It can go moist to dry, but um, it I don't think it would like to be in standing water, but it can take a really good bit of moisture. I've got some right where the sprinklers hit it every day in the nursery and it's happy as can be. Okay, do you wanna take the other more general questions right now or? Sure, yep. I'm sure. Okay, is plant food fertilizer always required? Is there an option to make homemade plant food fertilizer? So, um, you know, when people come in and they ask how they can amend their soil when they're planting things, usually I tell them you, you don't really need it because these plants have evolved here in Virginia. They know how to grow in Virginia. They, our clay soil is exactly what they need. However, if all your top soil has been stripped away and that's been you know within the last five years, you may want to add some compost to it um, you can make your own, you can get some worms and do worm composting, you can compost your kitchen scraps, you could get some horse manure from the local farmer or chicken manure, or there's a lot of alpaca farms around that will sell their, their stuff. And then at the nursery, we just got one this year called alpaca poop. So, and there's another company that sells baba poo. So you can get all sorts of natural ones. You can make it yourself um, if, if you need it, but you may not need it. So. And one that that's a good lead into um, you can do a soil test, you know, at the libraries as well as at the extension office, you can pick up a soil test kit and there's directions on there how to collect your soil. You put it in a little box. I think it's maybe 20 bucks. You mail it off to Virginia Tech and they mail back to you what's in your soil. So that can be helpful as well. So. Very helpful. Thank you, Julie. Can you recommend any herbs for cover or garden that attract bees and butterflies? So, um, most of the Mediterranean herbs that you can grow, they'll, they're great, you know, butterflies and bees, they like them, they go to them. Um, and then we, a lot of those, we have native counterparts to them. We have a native basil, we have um, a native, uh, the mountain mint, we've got um, the Monarda family or the bee balms, they are all very uh, 
very useful herbs. I know the Native Americans use them. A lot of people will grow it now for teas and stuff. They have a very strong smell. So uh, I'm sure you, could, sure you could find some uses for those, but all the Mediterranean herbs. And there is, um, is it, I think it might be oregano that will come back year after year. So, you know, there are some that are not annuals. I like to grow basil, but I hate that I have to pay for it every year. So yeah, there's that. <laughs> How can you remedy plants that roots are really compacted in the pot? I bought a gardenia and by the time I put it in the ground, the roots were crazy. And no matter how much I watered it, they would break down. So, you know, that's a lot of the plants in the nursery have that problem too. You know, we, they don't sell, they have to sit a year or whatever. And you go to take the pot off, you almost can't even get the pot off. There's so many roots in there and you, Get the pot off and it's all roots and there's no soil so it's amazing that that plant is still living so you know that the, the best thing to do is find a bigger pot and you know you can use water to break up the roots um, and and google it a lot of roots or a lot of plants have roots that you can just kind of prune them you can prune a lot of those roots right off there's some plants that have fleshy roots like milkweed and that that don't like to um, have their tap root or fleshy root touched at all. But most plants, they're, they love a good root pruning and they're better for it. You know, it's, it's healthier for them. They can spread out then a little bit more in their pot um, and then just add some more soil in. Hope that answers that question. That's great. Okay. <laughs> I am getting married in October and I would like to try to grow some of my own florals and greenery. I have a backup plan, but I would like to try to reduce my impact and grow my own if I can. Additionally, I love cut flowers and would love any recommendations on cutting flowers. Oh, cool. That's Isn't cool. That? That's so cool. I love yeah. it. Congratulations. Um, so there is also, you might, you might be able to find her on Facebook. There's a local Loudoun lady called Fleur, F-L-E-U-R, Day, D-E, Leah, L-E-A-H. And she does cut flowers and she sells them at the uh, farmer's markets. But um, she does quite a few in her arrangements that are native plants. So things that I think look really nice in, I think it was October, um, Echinacea. So that's actually the purple plant in this flower right here looks would look good as a cut flower and goldenrod. There are some goldenrods that are amazing um, in, in an arrangement because they have long sweeping blooms. Goldenrod fireworks and goldenrod solar cascade look beautiful in, in an arrangement as and then you could, you know, fill in with other things. Sometimes uh, like Monardas can go late into the summer. You can get some reds and pinks in there. And um, a really nice one in floral arrangements is a grass called sea oats, Chasmanthium latifolium. Just really, really wispy. It adds a really nice delicate look in any floral arrangement. So think outside of the box there. You know, there's some really, really cool things there. And you can always add you know, American holly branches are great evergreen. Ferns are great in a cut arrangement. Uh, let's see, the uh, American sunflower family, it's in the helianthus family. There's several flowers there that are good for cut flowers. I mean, there's there's tons of them. But uh, yeah, I'm sure if you if you reached out to Fleur de Leah, her, her name is actually uh, Leah. Uh, I, I was reading a question, so I missed the name of that company, and I'd like to type it in. Could you tell me again? It's yes. Fleur? Fleur de Lea, like Fleur de Lea, but her name is Lea. It's F-L-E-U-R, Day, D-E, Lea, L-E-A-A. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, hold on one second, because I just got some more. Your favorite seed catalogs. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's really hard. Um, so probably the seed catalog that I use the most and order from the most is Prairie Moon because they have a wide variety of native plants. They have some non-natives as well, but their seed catalog is like you should have it in the library because it has so much information in it. And when I go visit um, some of the commercial growers and that every so often, 
they've all got a copy of the Prairie Moon Seed Catalog on their desk because it has really good information on how to propagate your seeds and what to look for. It's got great pictures of if you're collecting seeds, they have pictures of what every seed looks like, the actual seed. So, you know, it's just it's just a boatload of information. So I love that one. But, you know, and if it's for my garden, I like Johnny Seeds. You know, it's a great place to get uh, vegetable seeds from. So those are my favorites. Um, best native companion plants for vegetable gardens. Oh, so, you know, I've been kind of experimenting with this a little bit. Um, I put black blackberries, native blackberry shrubs all around my vegetable garden to try to keep the deer out, which it did, does do a pretty good job, but then the rabbits and the groundhogs came in, so that wasn't so great. But the Monarda family and the mountain mint family are two really good ones for around your vegetable garden because they attract gajillions of pollinators, but they also have very fragrant leaves, so it tends to keep some of those other critters away like the rabbits and the um, the groundhogs and the and the deer even kind of shy away from some of those. So those are probably my two favorites for around the garden. Um, let's see. But I I plant a lot of native native plants in the garden that are for food also, like the blueberries. Um, and this year we were exper experimenting with wild kidney bean. So we have a native bean that's a kidney bean that um, we can eat. And it's per, it's perennial, so it comes back every year. So uh, that's kind of kind of some things that we can in our garden. Heard of that. Uh, someone wanted to share that thyme is a low growing herb, like sun, doesn't need a lot of water, and the bees love it. It's from the Mediterranean. Yes, yeah, that is a good one too. Um, do deer eat flocks year round or only when it's blooming? I think it's only when it's blooming. Although, no, I'll take that back because I have had them munch it down when there's no flowers on it as well. And, you know, if you're if you're a Leesburg resident, uh, just a thing about deer, the um, the local sanitation right across from Lowe's there, you can pick up for free their TLC and that has got a fragrance that the deer don't like. I mean, the neighbors don't like the smell either, but it, it does keep the deer and critters away. So that can be helpful while you're trying to get things established. But, you know, a lot of native plants, um, the deer will come munch it down and sometimes they're just better for it. It's like a natural pruning. So if you can protect it until it's a full grown plant, a lot of times it can hold its own with the deer. What are the rules for planting near a house's foundation? How close, what plants are no-nos, et cetera? Yeah. <laughs> so there's, you know, there's a lot of schools of thought on some people say they don't care what it is, it should be at least three feet from your foundation, which is very logical so that you can walk along there and maintain things. Um, I, I plant right up to my foundation, but I stay away from things that I know are water loving, especially like pussy willow and sycamore and anything really big, obviously, so it doesn't fall on the house, but anything that likes a lot of water. Um, one, you don't want all that much water next to your house, but if it doesn't find the water, it's going to try and come into your house and find the water, especially if you have water pipes along that wall or whatever. So I would just stay away from the water loving things and, and obviously anything too tall, too big, like giant trees. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a lot of people asking you to repeat, like the names of some flowers and the names of some of the websites <laughs> you shared. So I'm going to tell everybody now um, that here is my email address. And if you send me an email, I can send you a recording of this. And so you can get all that information. Yes, and I, I do have recording. a list of all the plants that uh, like I carry is on the watermarkwoods.com. And I think this presentation, um, I Lorraine, so she can always screen grab or send you whatever you need from that as well. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much for that, Julie. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Any other questions? I think I saw one fly by about vines too. So I'll just. Um, oh, yes. Okay. Fast growing, but not invasive native vine to cover fences. That one just came in. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's, there's not a ton of native vines, um, but there's a couple that I really, really like. 
Um, the first one would be uh, our native honeysuckle, the Lonicera sempervirens, and it's beautiful. It's got a picture of, you know what, I can show you a picture, right? Oh yeah, I would love to see it. The picture on the front cover of that book, and it is vibrant, it is bright. <gasps> It blooms all summer long, and mine even had a few uh, flowers on it in December. So I, I had to take a picture. I couldn't believe it. It's evergreen. It blooms in full sun. It blooms in full shade. It can literally grow anywhere. It doesn't like a ton of moisture, likes a little bit on the dry side, but it's beautiful, and it's a great performer. Um, other vines, I really like Dutchman's Pipe Vine. It takes maybe two years to get established, but once it's established, it'll grow like crazy. So um, it, and it's, it's neat. It has very small flowers that look like a Dutchman's pipe that hang underneath the leaves. So you kind of have to know to look for them, but it's the only host for the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. So if you look up that butterfly, it's beautiful. It's blue with some orange spots. You're gonna wanna plant that vine, I guarantee it. And then the other vine that I, I really I have great luck with and I really like it is uh, Carolina Jasmine, it's Gelsemium Caroliniana. It's got a yellow flower and it is a um, uh, evergreen. And the flower buds are very yellow. It starts in March and then it blooms at the end of April. So it's almost like you've got four to six weeks of bloom time with that, with those bright yellow buds, but it's, really pretty and it's quite a fast grower a lot of times you'll see it at the bottom of a hill and it just grows right up the hill but you can you can cut you have to kind of train it on your fence but it grows great on a fence as well anything um what is the name of that honeysuckle again uh it's american or coral honeysuckle and the latin name is lonicera l-o-n-i-c-e-r semper virens Okay, and what's a good plant identifier app? You know, there's there's a lot of them out there. So I started out using LeafSnap um, and it uses facial recognition software and it's pretty good. Uh, the one that I, this year, that I really kind of just discovered and I'm getting kind of addicted to it is um, iNaturalist. And you can use it for plants, animals, It's and it's really pretty good. So you take a picture with your phone, it's an app, take a picture with your phone, and it, it'll help you, it'll give you three or four, 20, however many it comes up with things to choose from. Um, but the cool thing is that it then records it. So you can have a list of all the plants you saw, and it uses GPS, so it'll say where you saw it. So it puts a little pin there. and so, you know, if somebody comes to my property and they take a picture of a plant, it'll say this plant was spotted at Watermark Woods and here's what it was and here's who saw it. And then if, if you can't get a good ID off of it, it kind of crowdsources and other people who use the app can see your pictures and they can say, oh, you know, you said it was this kind of cricket, but really it's that kind of cricket. So it does plants, trees, insects, amphibians, birds. It's really, really good. And then you can look and see, you know, like how many species did I identify this year? Where did I go on a vacation or whatever? So it, it's really a neat app. So that's iNaturalist. Okay. And someone wrote in, <laughs> how about human beings? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and someone said, Lona, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I never took Latin. <laughs> Lona Sierra Sempivirens. Yep. Right? Sempivirens. Yep. Okay. That's pearl honeysuckle, yeah. Okay, that's it. So I will share that with everyone. There we go. Okay. Just please um, disregard this right here. <laughs> That's not the recording link. I'm sorry. Copy and paste doesn't work that well in the chat box. And so it uh, picked up something else that I sent before the program. So, you know, but if you send me an email, I'll make sure that you get a copy of the recording 
and Julie said she would send me the slides. Just let me know which one you want. Yeah. Okay. You, know, um, you have Lorraine's email address. My email address is julie at watermarkwoods.com and you can find me on Facebook and I have a website and all that business. I'm happy to answer questions. I even get texts. Somebody will say, I'm at this nursery and I want to buy this plant, but it's not, is it native or not? So, you know, I'm happy to answer any sort of questions, you know, and, and I, I am in this role because I love the plants and I want people to have native plants and I want people to be able to have access to garden for themselves and get the joy out of creating the joy that um, bringing wildlife to you can bring to you. So I'm, you know, I'm not in it just purely to sell plants. So ask me questions, send me notes. I love to answer questions. Um, and go, go to the library and get a design book and look through things because that's how you know what you like is by seeing pictures. You know, I can't, I can't come up with my own original designs to save my life, but if I see something in a book, I can steal it. No problem. Yeah. And the Buffy Mellon books are just gorgeous. Her oh, yeah. gardens were amazing. I mean, they're very sophisticated, but you can, you're right. Just copy little sections or ideas. Yeah. If you're yeah. new to plants or, you know, there, or even birds or whatever, there's tons of guides out there. There's this one for, from Plant Nova Natives, but, you know, there's the Audubon guides. The Peterson guides are really, really good. You know, they're all at the library. They're all on, you know, we can buy them also. So there's so many resources out there. You just can't go wrong. You can't get too much information. Someone said that they should make an app, a web app with pictures of all these native plants. Do you, do you know of anything like that? So really, um, the Plant Nova Natives one does have pictures of them. And I, the National Wildlife Federation has one that's fairly new um, that I haven't played around with very much, but people say it's really good. I've heard really good things about it. So you can go to the National Wildlife Federation also. But Google, you know, I love the Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how about topiary? Any place to learn? Oh, so just regular old topiary? Um, yeah, I think so. I would check with places like uh, Green Springs and um, Merrifield. They're always giving classes on stuff like that. Okay. Definitely not my expertise. <laughs> okay, all right. Any other questions before we go? All right. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I know I'm really excited to go out and plant. Thank you so much, Julie. Thanks a lot, Lorraine. And thanks everybody for, for being here. It's always fun. Absolutely. See y'all next time. I think uh, we have a program coming up on bats. And then after in April, we have one coming up on birding. So please keep, keep checking the library events calendar or our Facebook page. Or if you want to be on our programming newsletter that's sent out every Monday with a list of the programs for the week, just send me an email and I'll put you on the list. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Julie, if you would hold on just a second. Yep, no problem. Okay. Um. Okay, that's it. That was great, Julie. Oh, that was awesome. Just the right amount of time and um really good information. I mean, those apps are from the uh, websites are phenomenal. Yeah, they, yeah. It, I mean, it's always better when I can share my screen and actually go to the website, but uh, hopefully they all got the picture. <laughs> yeah. I